So we have several uh, insect and related pests uh, that damage uh, rice in California. We are, and, and here's just a basic uh, list of them. Uh, most of these are problems uh, from the seedling stage to about the four leaf stage. Uh, Army worms, which we became very familiar with this year, are uh, problems somewhat later in the season. And then uh, stink bugs appear to be a developing problem that are uh, uh, most closely damaged the rice in, term, in, the, in the flowering and harvest periods, so they damage the kernels. So we're very so that looks like a long list, and there are several uh, pests there. But we're very fortunate uh, in the state that there are many very severe rice pests of the world that we don't have in California or in the United States. Uh, leaf offers, a plant offers, rice stem bar are pests in Asia, very, very serious pests, and we are lucky that we don't have those in California. Uh, there are other uh, group of pests that are in the southern rice production area, but we don't have these in California. The rice state bug, uh, Mexican rice borer, sugar cane borer, our problems in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, but we don't have to deal with those in California. So another pest that is in also the southern uh, rice belt, uh, we had this critter in California at one time, the pentacle rice mite. Uh, can potentially do quite serious damage. Uh, we had this on in the greenhouses on the UC Davis campus in 2009, but fortunately we were able to eradicate it. Never did find it in grower fields, fortunately it was on campus, and we've gotten rid of this. <coughs> Another pest that is in California, potentially a serious rice pest, called the channeled apple snail. Uh, a little bit hard to see this, but it's a snail about the size of your fist, very large snail. These are the eggs. Uh, this is in some natural water bodies in Southern California. Again, potentially is a serious rice pest in water seeding systems. It's in Texas, uh, in their rice production area, but in their drill seeding rice, really not a factor if this would take, were to get up into this part of California. Uh, in our systems, it could be a serious pest. It is in other parts of the world. <coughs> So the pests that we do have, we deal with them with a multifaceted approach. Uh, we're using cultural control measures, uh, well-adapted varieties that Kent talked about, uh, weed management, uh, uh, planting, uh, uh, appropriate planting dates, et cetera, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. We also uh, emphasize biological control of some of the pests, uh, primarily of uh, armyworms, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, something that we don't think about is regulatory control. All those pests that I talked about that are in Texas, Louisiana, Asia, that we don't have here. You know, why don't we have them here? Because we have regulatory uh, uh, restrictions in, in place in terms of bringing seed, regular rice products into California. Those have to be inspected and go through processes to keep those pests out of California. So that's an important aspect that we don't commonly think about that's happening in the background. Uh, host plant resistance, uh, really not well developed. Uh, the varieties that Kent talked about, there's some minor differences in how they respond to pests, but not huge differences, and uh, that, that's another possible area. And then pheromones, you know, pheromones are used for some of the uh, fruit crop and nut, nut pests, uh, not something that's developed in, in, for pests in California. So and we also have insecticides, and these are the basic list of insecticides that are registered and used for the various pests. Uh, rice water weevil, pyrethroids, demoline, belay. Uh, basically, this is the uh, uh, list of insecticides. We just use various ones for different pests. Uh, seed midge, tadpole shrimp. Uh, Army worms have again become a big issue this year. Again, we're relying on pyrethroids, uh, demoline to some extent, seven, and then BT products. So we have a limited number of insecticides. You know, some are effective for some pests, others are effective for other, other pests, and we just kind of have to uh, cut and paste and, and put them in, into the appropriate slots. So what what materials are used 
for uh, insect pest control in rice that shows about the last 15 years uh, the database that DPR maintains and the yellow bar here is Warrior and other generic products so you can see Warrior gets the line share and the use of Warrior has been going up you know, maybe I should say that with regulatory uh, uh, representatives here in the audience but that's the reality you can see basically it's doubled from 2008 to 2013 uh, about uh, 180,000 acres uh, treated with Warrior in 2013 um, Mustang, another pyrethroid here in, in uh, purple. Um, also, a lot of you know fairly widely used. And then the other products here, are seven and Demlin, uh, other products really aren't used to, to any extent. You know, another product that kind of falls into the entomology camp would be. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, most of the applications for rice water weevil are made to the perimeters of the field, so the entire check isn't treated that just maybe 50, 7,500 feet adjacent, adjacent to the levee. The other product that we're concerned with is uh, copper sulfate, which is uh, used in part for tadpole shrimp. And copper sulfate use has been going down for various reasons I don't have time to go into right now. And this trend, it stops here in 2011, but the trend has continued into the uh, more recent years. So we'll go through each of these uh, five or six pests in a little bit of detail. Uh, starting out with the one that you encounter first in the in the production production year, and that's uh, right seed midge. So this is what the critter looks like here. Uh, many people confuse them with mosquitoes. You'll see swarms of seed midge right after the field is flooded. Uh, these actually do not bite at all. Mosquitoes, obviously, as you well know, do bite, but they look a lot like mosquitoes. Uh, what do these do? They drop eggs into the water. Those eggs hatch into a larva. The larva feeds within this mud tube that you can see right here. And what does it do? It hollows out the seed. It feeds on the, the seed right when it germinates. And that can you know, obviously kill the seed and kill the germinating uh, established uh, seedling. Uh, you know, how do you know if you have them? Well, Many times you don't know that you have them until you don't have a stand. You go out there you know, 10 days after seeding, you say, I should be starting to see a little bit out here. And no, you don't see anything out there. If you look really closely, you'll see a bunch of these mud tubes. And that's uh, the critical evidence that right seed uh, was involved. What do you do about them? Um, I pretty much have just said that. So this is just an example of one of my plots. Uh, where we had seed midge. I mean, you can see no no stand here, and at the other end of the of the field of the plot, perfect stands. They could be fairly spotty, uh, depending on where where the field. Uh, how do you manage it? You know, minimize the time from flooding to getting a stand up. You know, we talked earlier about the field leveling, getting the water across the entire field quickly, getting uh, the seed in the field as quickly as possible. But in reality, the main maybe the main component is having nice weather to get that stand up. So if you have a cool period of weather, which obviously you can't do anything about, uh, that's going to delay the seed germination, delay getting the stand up, and that just creates perfect conditions for seed pitch to, to attack that seed. In terms of insecticides, uh, seed treatments would be an approach. We don't really have any seed treatments uh, here at this time. Uh, pyrethroid pre-flood would be a, an approach that's strictly a preventative method. You don't really know if you're going to have the infestation when you do that, and the infestation doesn't occur in all fields or even in all checks in all fields. That makes it difficult. We try to use a post-flood application you know, many times, again, you don't know you have the problem until it's too late to treat, so that makes it, makes it difficult. Another pest that falls very similar to this would be uh, tadpole shrimp. Uh, tadpole shrimp uh, is an interesting critter. It's not an insect, it's a crustacean actually. You can see the, the critter there. Uh, tadpole shrimp lay their eggs in the soil and those eggs are very resistant. So if you have a rice field that has tadpole shrimp in the soil and you rotate out of rice and just let the field fallow, be fallow for 10 years, which I can't imagine you do that, 
you come back 10 years later and flood that field, those eggs are still viable. As soon as you put water in the field, the eggs hatch. So they're very resistant. Uh, once the water is applied, the eggs hatch in one to two days. And also the other fact is that not all the eggs are going to hatch. So some of them are going to hatch this year. Uh, some of them, even in the flooded field, aren't going to hatch. They're going to wait until next year to hatch. Some of them are going to wait for three years to hatch. So it's a, you know, it's an insect or a critter that's there and has a mechanism to, to stay, uh, to stay uh, persistent in your field. What do they do? You know, it's fairly similar to, to seed midge. They feed on the seed and they feed on the, the coleoptile as it emerges out of that seed. You know, the damage is a little, little bit later than seed mid. Seed mid is right on that seed. You know, this feeds on the seedling as, it, as it's starting to establish. Uh, how do you know if you have them? Many times you're going to see the floating seedlings. You're going to see some damage. You see some nipped off right here. You'll see the evidence of the tadpole shrimp. Uh, either dead shrimp or their, their skins as they get molded and increased in size. And many times the, the key dead giveaway is muddy water. You know, the water is really muddy, it's not windy, you know, you shouldn't have uh, waves out there, but the water is muddy, that's dead giveaway, you've got tadpole shrimp going on out there. So damage the, the seedling and also reduce uh, light penetration because of the muddy water. Uh, this critter is also sold as a pet, so you can go into pet stores and buy the eggs in a little envelope. And your kids do it for science projects. You know, you have these little granules, and granulars, these little eggs. You put them in water, and the next day later, you have something swimming around. So it's like, you know, wow, it's amazing, you know. So uh, if you want to get some, you can find them there. Uh, how do you deal with this uh, this critter again? You know, get that stand up as soon as possible. Get it established, get it pecked down, rooted down. And you know, once the seedlings are a couple inches, three inches tall, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, insecticides or other products can be useful. Copper sulfate is a material that used to be used a lot, but that's sort of going out of favor now. Uh, other insecticides, pyrethroids, uh, although it's not listed on the label, can be used and are used for tadpole shrimp. This is a, an organism that's in you know, the last five or six years has really taken off, becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And right now we have a student that's trying to you know, figure out what has changed in our rice system that's caused tadpole shrimp to become such a significant problem. It's always been here, but it's usually you know, fairly spotty in severity, but the last five or six years it's been a more, more widespread problem. So what's changed? And anybody has any ideas? Talk to Cass, talk to Louise, talk to me, but that's something we're we'll actively researching at this time. So crayfish, not really going to say much of anything about crayfish. Uh, a potential problem, and really the problem with crayfish is not so much damaging the rice, but burrowing in right by the boxes and causing water seepage. If that's treated water that's in the holding period, you, know, you don't want it seeping out of your field. So that's really the problem with uh, with crayfish. Uh, potentially, can, they can damage the plants, but the main problem is just uh, you know, compromising the integrity of the, of the levees. Rice leaf miner, basically another uh, another non-factor. Uh, it's a small fly, lay eggs on the leaves, and uh, the larva tunnels in the leaves. You know, a lot of the, the newer uh, rice uh, growers here in the audience, I would say, they've probably never seen this. And 15 years ago, you used to see it in every field. It wasn't a big problem, didn't didn't cause damage, but you'd see it in every field. But in recent years, I, I seldom see this thing. Uh, and there are the eggs on the leaves. Why don't we see it where we've gone more to shallow water? which tends to uh, minimize it, the infestation from uh, leaf miner. And there are also a couple species of parasites that parasitize the eggs, parasitize the larvae, and over the years they've done a great job and reduced this thing down from here down to here as we sell it to you anymore. Not, not really a factor. Rice water weevil, I want to talk about this for, uh, for a few minutes. It's an insect uh, that's been here for 60 years or so, since 1959 throughout the entire uh, production area. 
uh, for in, in, the, in Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley down in Michelle's area as well. Um, it's also in the southern rice production area, series pest there. Uh, California has provided it to much of Asia, so the pest went from California to Asia in the timber rice production areas in Asia. And then most recently, about five or six years ago, it was found in, in Italy, in the rice area in Italy, and now it's spreading throughout the rice production area in, in, in Italy. Um, so it's a serious pest that's really throughout the, the entire timber timber rice area. It's not a tropical insect, not a subtropical insect, but really in this temperate area. So the life cycle here in California is that there's one generation per year. So the adults for the weevil, which is this critter right here, overwinters in on the levees, uh, ditch banks, uh, just anywhere they can get some protection from the elements. So they burrow down uh, in, this, in the grass in late fall in the rest of the fall, the winter, and the early spring in these areas. Then in about March, they wake up from their winter hibernation, so to speak, start to feed and on, on grasses and, and other weeds. As soon as the fields are flooded, they immediately enter the field. It's just amazing how fast they detect that water and enter the field as soon as the field is flooded. Even before it's seeded, obviously you don't have to stand there yet, but as soon as there's water, the weevils enter the field. Uh, they lay eggs, those eggs hatch, lay eggs in the seedlings, the eggs hatch, here's a, a blow up of the egg. Eggs hatch, the larvae drop down and feed on the roots of the rice plants. And what does that do? You know, this is an example here of a normal plant and a damaged plant, and here are the larvae that have done that damage. This occurs in June, July, late July then, uh, the insect pupates and the adult, adults reemerge. Re they don't do any damage, they don't do anything. They quickly leave the rice field for this uh, vegetative area to spend the fall and the winter. So there's one, one generation per year. Uh, I mentioned in the, in the late in March, April, they wake up from the winter hibernation and they will fly. So they fly to infest new areas, and we monitor the flight uh, every year with, with a series of light traps, so they're attracted to light. And the flight varies from year to year. I'll have growers that ask me, you know, is it a heavy weevil year, a light weevil year? Indeed, they, it does differ. This shows a number of weevils that we captured in 2012 here in blue, and you can see some fairly high levels here in this one night. In the light trap, we captured over 2,000 weevils in one night. 2011 here in green, you can hardly see there's, there's basically no weevils captured. So the flight varies from year to year. And you can total up the flight, and we've done that. And again, you can see there are heavy years and there are light years. So it causes the variation, you know, nobody really knows, but indeed it does vary. And the other thing is that the flight only occurs on, on certain nights. I can back up here, you can see that. You know, all these nights from March to late June, you know, they really only flew on maybe five or six nights. The other nights, they're just there and waiting for the right conditions. You know, what are those right conditions? Those right conditions are warm, muggy evenings. You have those evenings that's, you know, 70 to 80 degrees at 8 o'clock, uh, calm winds, sort of high humidity, and that's what causes the, the wheels to fly. You know, the other uh, uh, reality is that there are parts of the Sacramento Valley where there are high populations of weevil, parts of the valley where there are low populations. Where is that? Well, um, Butte County, uh, Wellows, uh, Gridley, etc. You know, high populations of weevils. Uh, over on the west side, some areas, but in the, the lower end of the Sacramento Valley, very low populations of rice water weevil. So it just depends on where you are as to how severe a pest this is. Let's get both of those. So what damage does this uh, insect do? How does it inflict damage? The adults feed on the leaves and leave uh, these types of uh, uh, longitudinal scars. That's really not significant. It doesn't affect yield. What is more important would be the larvae. 
great feed on the, the roots and result in uh, stunted growth, less tillering, uh, less root systems, plant can't handle other stresses, just overall sets up the plant for uh, a difficult situation if it uh, loses its roots. What is the threshold? How much damage does this insect uh, inflict? Threshold is uh, one larva, basically one larva per plant. How much damage can that do? Uh, if the infestation occurs when the rice is very young, two leaf stage, that can cause about 25 to 30% grain loss. If it's a little bit later, say three leaf stage when the infestation occurs, that can cause maybe a 20% grain loss, yield, yield loss. If the infestation occurs when the rice is at the four leaf stage or bigger, the rice isn't really affected at all. It's established enough, it's far enough along its development that the weevil doesn't really affect the yield. <coughs> And just covered that. How do we manage rice water weevils? There's a long history of that, uh, starting out from uh, you know, all during and some chlorinated hydrocarbons back in the 60s and 70s. We then switched to carboferian from about 78 to 2000. That product went off the market. We then switched to pyrethroids, warrior, Mustang, starting about 2000. We're still using those products. Most recently, uh, neonicotinoid delay was fresh in 2014, and there's a couple other products are in the pipeline that we're going to see here soon. So, now we you know, constantly uh, switch approaches, switch products as you know, regulatory actions, uh, uh, other factors take products off the market, but we've been able to keep uh, you know, active, effective products on the market. Uh, primarily emphasizing right now pyrethroids, which primarily are active on the adult stage. So you put them on the field at about the two leaf stage. It kills the weevil adults and they're moving into the field. You kill the adults before they can lay eggs, so you don't have the damaging model population. So that's the approach with uh, pyrethroids. Belay uh, is a bit more uh, broad insectivity in that it will kill the larvae. It also has an activity on adults. So belay has a slightly wider range of activity compared to pyrethroids. How do you know if we need to treat a field? Uh, we've looked at various sampling methods. We looked at a little trap uh, several years ago, but the bottom line is really right here based on field history. If you know your fields, you know areas that typically have weevils. You remember a, a you know, field that got hit five years ago, you know, you're more apt to continue to treat that field. So it's really based on observations, field history, where you are in the valley, as opposed to some sampling method that we can recommend uh, at this time. What are the concerns with the approach we use now, pyrethroids? Uh, they're listed here. You know, one is resistance. Are we going to develop resistance in, in rice water? Uh, we looked at this in 2013, and we really have not developed resistance using this pro these products for uh, 15 years or so. Uh, weevil is as susceptible now as it was. Uh, there are environmental concerns that are uh, uh, starting to crop up that people are concerned about. Uh, movement in, into waterways, uh, that's an issue, a regulatory issue that's going to have to be dealt with. You know, something that we can deal with uh, in, in terms of production, but something that's good maybe a factor. Uh, what about effect on non-target insects? Uh, why you know, are we worried about non-targets? We're concerned about those because of mosquitoes. You, know, you don't want to wipe out all the things that are eating mosquito larvae in rice fields and result in a boom of mosquitoes. So we've been looking at non-targets, and basically the bottom line is very, very short-term effects of pyrethroids on non-target insects. So it's not nearly as serious or as uh, widespread against as people are saying or would have predicted. So a pretty good picture, uh, picture there. What about the other products that we're researching that are coming down the pipe? Uh, three other ones here. Uh, Corrigin is a product that uh, is in the pipeline for registration. I don't know when that's going to happen. That is very effective on rice water weevil. 
Uh, also affecting on army worms if uh, that is continues as an issue. Uh, flat on flat sand as a seed treatment. Uh, we don't have any seed treatments right now, but we'll continue to do research with that. And then this is a biological product that we've looked at that shows good activity and might have, might have a nice fit for uh, organic production. What about other ways to control rice water weevil? Talk about just really one, and that's winter flooding. So I know you're flooding fields in the winter for other reasons, for all decomposition, waterfowl, etc. But we've shown that that reduces populations of water weevil larvae in the spring and summer. So what you're doing in the winter affects what's happening in the growing season. You know, that reduction here is 50-60%. Uh, so the yellow bar will be numbers of weevil larvae in uh, winter flooded, and then the green is in non-flooded. So it doesn't eliminate them, but it's a 50-60% reduction, you know, helps. But why does that happen? We don't exactly know, we've been researching it, but it, it is a consistent, repeatable thing that we're confident is, uh, is, a real, is, is real. What about varieties? This, I'm going to skip over this, or get us to lunch and get us to Louise. But varieties, there are some differences in varieties. Again, none of the varieties are resistant, but the way they respond to water weevil uh, differs from, from one variety to another. Some varieties re regenerate the roots very, very fast. So the weevils feed, they, they stress, they destroy the root tissue, but the plant just grows it back. So that's something we've looked at, and it is uh, something I think is worth considering. You know, let's skip over these. Army worms, and two last steps to talk about uh, quickly. Uh, army worms, I know have been a big issue this year. Uh, we typically see army worms starting about now through August. This year we saw them in June. Why? I don't know. We also saw army worms uh, down in San Joaquin Valley on cotton, tomatoes, alfalfa, etc. in May. We had a big spike of army worms down there, then they went away. So it just seems to be an army worm year. Uh, as a point of reminder, there are two species of army worms. Uh, they, they both do the same type of damage, but they differ a bit in that one, which we call the true army worm, here's the adult stage, will lay its eggs on rice. The other species, the western yellow striped army worm, actually lays its eggs on broadleaf weeds. So if you have higher levels of broadleaf weeds in rice, that tends to promote populations of this species because they're laying eggs on the, on the weeds themselves. What kind of damage do the army worms do? When should we be concerned with them, concerned about them? If it's feeding on leaf tissue, it's problematic if you have 25% or more of the leaf tissue removed. So the rice plant uh, during the vegetative stage, during this, this part of the year, really has an excess amount of leaf tissue. It can take quite a bit of damage, quite a bit of removal of leaf tissue and still produce a, um, a normal yield. So 25% is sort of that trigger point of where you should be worried about it. As you move later in, in August, the sense that will feed on the panicles, and that's more problematic because obviously this is what we want to harvest. If the uh, insect larvae remove kernels, developing kernels, that's a problem. So the, the, the threshold is that 10% or more of the panicles are fed upon then that would trigger an application. Uh, it's important to separate this damage from rats. So rats will do the same type of damage, and you'll see damage, uh, damage develop the panicles. It's important to make that distinction. You need to see what uh, So what is the life cycle of this insect? Uh, about a 30-day life cycle. They develop at temperatures greater than 50 degrees and uh, the development maxes out at 84 degrees. Not to say the diet temperatures above 84 degrees, but if it's 90 degrees, they're not gonna develop any faster than they will at 84 degrees. It takes about, the larval stage lasts about 20 days. Uh, so moth, egg, this larval stage on average is about 20 days. But the problem is it's hard to see the small larvae out in the rice fields. So you really can't see the larvae until they get some size, and that's about the last 10 days of their, of their existence. 
so you can actually see the larvae. Control, uh, there's natural control going on, and that is a couple of different small parasitic wasps that kill the larvae, and what's left when that happens, you'll see just a carcass here, and you also see a small little, uh, about the size of a rice kernel, uh, stippled black and, and uh, white. That's what's left after the parasite has stung the larva and killed the larva. So you know, look for these in the field. You know, these are good guys. These are helping us out. Uh, the other possibilities would be insecticides like pyrethroids, uh, demolon. Well, the demolon has a very long pre-harvest interval, making it basically not usable. And then uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, a biological insecticide, is also uh, effective. But I will admit that we really, at this point, do not have an insecticide that can deal with some of the infestations that we that we had earlier in the month. You know, all these insecticides have some limitations in terms of how well they control um, control other ones. And this just shows uh, levels of parasitism. Uh, one here we did some surveys. It can be up to 60 percent. So the parasites, uh, small wasp, and killing the larva can be can be very common in some cases. Yeah. Last thing I want to cover just briefly are a couple of kernel pests that we that we've been doing work on. Um, why are we doing work on these? Well, maybe five or six years ago we had some reports from growers that they were seeing some pecky lice and damage on their kernels. Uh, that's not something we'd seen previously. It's very common in southern U.S., but not something we've seen here. We searched around for an insect cause and found some uh, critters called the red-shouldered stick bug. This is the adult. These are the nymphs. And there are reports in the literature uh, from Mississippi that this insect can feed on rice and damage the developing kernels. Um, again, not something that's widespread, not something we've seen previously, but it seems like it's a developing problem here. Uh, we also found a publication from 1939. Louise found it in his office in, from California, suggesting that they had an outbreak of ritual to stick bug in 1939. So we started thinking around some of the old material, and there's some really you know, gems there if we find the right, right publication. So we, we've been collecting these in, uh, red shoulder stink bugs and putting them on the rice to see what type of damage they do and how much damage they, they potentially uh, can cause. We had two different approaches for this. One approach was that we covered uh, sections of, uh, of uh, rice fields with these cages, put the stink bugs into the cages. You can see that cage here, the stink bug, then came back and looked at the amount of damage. The other approach we used, and Luis did this, this type of study, the other approach uh, we used, and I did this, was we covered individual panicles, developing panicles with this little cage, put the stink bugs in a little cage, uh, two stink bugs in these cages, then came back at harvest to see how much damage we had and uh, if the stink bug was causing damage. So what did we find? Well, this is data from uh, um, the studies Luis did, and um, Looking at not infested cages, pecking rice, percent, not much damage, but we don't have any stink bugs. If you have stink bugs, you know, two and a half to three percent damage. So it, it can happen. These are the studies I did with uh, individual panicles covered, with two stink bugs per panicle, and where we didn't put any uh, stink bugs on milk stage rice, no damage, or we did put stink bugs uh, on the milk stage rice, about five and a half percent damage. So certainly the stink bugs do have the potential to cause, to cause damage. How common are these stink bugs in rice fields? We surveyed 49 fields in September of last year, and uh, this, these are the fields we looked at. About 30% of them we could find red shoulder stink bugs uh, in September in these fields. Yeah, I mean, again, it's not to say they're doing a tremendous amount of damage, it's not to say, not to say they're very common, but they are in rice fields. And we have made the link that they, they can potentially cause damage. Uh, the fields that we commonly found stink bugs, red shoulder stink bugs, were fields that also had uh, uh, weeds in the field in some, some level, and then fields that were in areas 
you know, not where it's just rice, 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 but areas that have some crop diversity. Uh, in fields near riparian habitat, in fields that had uh, grassy weeds along the edge, or actually in the field itself. So this is the type of damage that we see uh, when speak bug is fed, cause the discoloration, and uh, obviously this is what, what we want to see with our rice. So looks like it might be a developing problem, you know, where we don't have any recommendations for treatment, don't know which fields would need to be treated, don't have any idea about threshold, but does look like a, a situation that might uh, work, be worthy of some, some attention and effort over the, over the years. That's, that's it, and I, Bruce might like to have one question or Bruce one. Or two. Oh, two. Two, <laughs> two questions. Otherwise, I'll be around at lunch, and as we enjoy lunch, just feel free to come on and ask me a couple questions. All right. Thank you very much.